Time for questions to the Minister for Justice, Mrs Naomi Long, and I call Mr Alec Easton to ask the first question. Mr Easton. Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, um, could I ask the Minister question number one? Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. There has been no decision made by my department to cut funding for Bangor alternatives. We do, however, provide annual core funding, currently at £54,000, to Northern Ireland Alternatives and Community Restorative Justice Ireland to sustain their central administrative infrastructure, assist with the delivery of community restorative justice and to help with capacity building. There will be no reduction in this funding for the coming financial year. In addition, further funding is provided to the organisations by my department and its agencies for specific projects including work on delivery of restorative elements of enhanced combination orders, local projects in association with PCSPs and the Assets Recovery Community Scheme, and tackling paramilitarism programme work through PBNI's ASPIRE programme. I understand that the member's question may have been prompted by a decision taken by the Cross-Departmental Tackling Paramilitarism Programme Board not to award funding for these accredited groups for the coming financial year 2021-22. This funding, which had been provided for the past three years, is separate to any core funding provided by my department and has been used to enable the groups to support the delivery of Fresh Start recommendations, in particular the development of a centre of restorative excellence. I understand this decision was taken by the Board in light of considerable funding pressures and the likely impact of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic on establishing a new centre in the coming year. The Board also noted that there has been substantial investment in restorative practice through other funding streams for the accredited organisations within the overall Tackling Paramilitarism programme. Mr Easton. Thank you. Could I thank the Minister for her answer so far? <clears throat> Would the Minister agree with me that Bangor Alternatives do a fantastic job? in cooperation with the PSNI, and would she maybe take the opportunity, once the pandemic is, is gone, to come down and visit Bangor Alternatives to see the excellent work with the PSNI that they are doing? Well, I thank the member for the invitation, and I would be more than happy to do so. I do recognise um, the important contribution um, that organisations make in supporting criminal justice partners, uh, whether that is through mediation and support for victims or um, challenging perpetrators of crime, providing community engagement in areas where none may otherwise be possible, or verifying threats and sharing information. My officials have met with both of the parent organisations, um, and I uh, just to better understand the impact of the board's decision, and I have also asked for further advice on the matter, but I will be happy to take the member up on the invitation. Ms Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Um, it's my understanding that funding for specific project work, such as that on the protocol, has been cut or proposed to be cut. And I do appreciate this might not be a departmental core funding matter, but does the Minister appreciate that any reduction in funding towards restorative justice organisations, such as that of Bangor Alternatives, will mean a cut in project work, such as community resolution notices and any work on the protocol? Well, with respect, um, the issue that <clears throat> pardon me, the issue um, that the programme board were not awarding funding for was in spe it was specific um, to the work um, in respect of the delivery of fresh start recommendations and, in particular, the development of the centre of restorative excellence. Um, so that the reason for not proceeding with the additional funding in, the, in this year is because of the issue, as I say, that the new centre won't actually be established in the incoming year. However, with re respect to the rest of restorative practice, certainly in terms of the Department of Justice and indeed in terms of other um, funds streams through tackling paramilitarism, um, funding remains available for restorative justice, and I believe it is important that it does. Ms. Carol McKillum. Uh, pray, last can call you. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. So, if I'm hearing the Minister correctly, then once COVID regulations are relaxed, that the possibility of the Fresh Start uh, commitments to alternatives and the Community Restorative Justice Ireland will then be uh, looked at again with a view of bringing that centre of excellence forward, given that the Minister has already said that the proposed cut isn't coming from her department. Well, just clarify, the Executive Action Plan recommendation A9 um, commits the Executive to establishing a dedicated fund for restorative justice initiatives to provide enhanced long-term funding and support. It is also required to resource the proposal for a Centre of Restorative Excellence, which is called CORE. 
something which the Department of Justice has been engaged around the preliminary work on, um, including a feasibility study um, to identify best options. Um, CORE would provide for a new innovative approach in terms of delivering expansion of restorative justice and also wider restorative practice in Northern Ireland. The Executive Office has been considering the most feasible approach on how to implement a dedicated fund for those restorative justice initiatives. A series of options for implementing the dedicated fund have been developed and officials within the Executive Office are exploring these further uh, with their special advisers. It is fair to say, though, that, that um, the, the core centre um, will not come forward in the current financial year, and therefore I think that is the reason why the programme board decided that the funding in order to support that could not be justified in a situation where not all bodies will be able to be funded to the full extent we would wish going forward. Um, if additional funding becomes available, um, and indeed in future um, financial years where we are not inhibited by COVID in terms of taking forward core, then I think that that is obviously something that will be for discussion with the programme board. Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker and Minister, in your response, you highlighted a number, number of other funding streams. It is my understanding that £1.4 million is shared between the two community and voluntary sector organisations, Community Restorative Justice Ireland and Alternatives, in relation to uh, restorative practices within the B4 areas. So there is a substantial amount of funding, and there are also statutory agencies that also uh, are responsible for uh, restorative justice. Uh, so I wonder, Minister, when was the last review in terms of value for money in, in, in delivery and in, indeed in terms of working alongside the PSNI across all crime sections? Well, I thank the member for her question. I can't give her, um, I suppose, a, a firm answer on the last time there was a full value for money review um, done of community restorative justice. But obviously, at every stage when it comes to budgeting, we look at the value for money of all of our expenditure within the department and we assess it against um, the various demands um, that we have in terms of those that are often unavoidable because of our statutory duties and indeed those um, about which we may have some flexibility. With respect to the investment in restorative justice, of course, the member is also correct that there are a number of organisations, including in the statutory sector, um, so for example, Probation Board um, and others who are involved in delivery of restorative justice. I believe restorative justice can play a role um, in the community in terms of challenging um, perpetrator behaviour, in terms of getting further recognition for victims of the harm um, that crime has caused them. And I believe that it is important um, that we continue to develop restorative justice in the context of it being properly um, accredited, um, properly monitored and properly supervised. And I think it's a hugely important piece of work that we're trying to take forward as part of developing the centre of excellence. Mr Stuart Dixon. Uh, question number two, Principal Deputy Speaker. Members will be aware that while the Executive Action Plan for tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime is coordinated within my department, the programme is a cross-cutting one in nature. Good progress has been made, but we are all too aware that countering the enduring pervasive nature of paramilitarism requires a long-term, genuinely collaborative approach across government, working closely with community partners. From a law enforcement perspective, Southampton UDA remains a priority group for the Paramilitary Crime Task Force. Recent convictions in the area have related to drugs, ammunition and offensive weapon offences. The Paramilitary Crime Task Force also continues to work with colleagues in local districts to tackle paramilitary activity and crime. In Middle East Antrim, a local drug strategy has been implemented, not only to target those individuals causing most harm to communities, but also to support the victims of such activity. Learning from delivery of the programme to date has underlined the importance of developing collaborative models of working between statutory agencies and community partners on the ground to respond effectively to issues in areas vulnerable to paramilitary coercion and control. This place-based working will be developed further in phase two of the programme. Multi-agency partnership working is already evident in a number of initiatives being delivered under the programme and which are active in the East Antrim area, including, for example, the Mid and East Antrim Youth Support Hub, a multi-agency support network supporting vulnerable young people at risk of being influenced or controlled by paramilitary groups. In addition, the Carrick, Fergus and Larne area has been identified as one of the eight priority areas for the focus of Communities and Transition Project. A number of projects are being delivered in the area relating to issues such as community safety, community capacity building and restorative justice. Members will be aware that tackling paramilitary activity and criminality is a priority for the executive. The initiatives I have described today are specific 
to the needs of individuals and communities in East Antrim, but continued investment is leading real change for the better for individuals and communities across Northern Ireland. Collaborative working across executive departments, drawing on all their strengths, can really deliver positive change. Mr Dixon. Thank you, Minister. Minister, you will no doubt be aware of a recent BBC Spotlight programme in which the horrific murder of Glenn Quinn, a loved uh, son and brother, uh, was highlighted in the programme. And indeed, it shone a, a, a much needed light into a very dark and murky corner of paramilitary activity in the town of Carrick Fergus. Minister, would you agree with me that condemnation on its own is widely insufficient and that we need our communities and people to step up and to speak out and to provide evidence to the PSNI and others of these vile activities that go on. This is not the only murder that has taken place in towns like Carrick Fergus and, and in the wider East Antrim uh, area, and particularly I think today of the Quinn family, but also of others going back as far as Simon Tang. Well, I thank the member for his comments, and I would say that anyone who saw the Spotlight programme last week, speaking to those affected by the murder of Glenn Quinn, could not fail to be both moved and appalled by what they heard. This was an innocent man who was brutally murdered. The Quinn family have my full support in standing up against these thugs. I would encourage anyone with information to contact the PSNI or to go through Crime Stoppers which is an independent charity and allows people to provide information anonymously. For people to do that, they have to have confidence that there will be a response. And I have confidence that if people report this information to the PSNI, that there will be a criminal justice response to those who are behind this activity. And I think it is incredibly important that that is the case. Mr Roy Beggs. Speaker, drug dealing, loan sharking, brutal violence, are hallmarks of organised crime groups. Uh, let's not beat about it, the bush. It's clear that there are abusive members, gangs, that are uh, taking advantage of their local community. So my question to the Minister is, when will those responsible for some of these murders be brought to account, and how will she be supporting vulnerable members of the community who have to live there? How can they be given protection so that they can be assured uh, that they can live safely uh, with their friends and families. Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I think the member makes a very important point. For those that we ask to come forward with information in communities, there is a huge vulnerability and a fear. We already know um, that people can be murdered in their homes simply because they have made an off-hand comment um, about thuggery, about drug dealing in their communities. These are absolutely ruthless organisations who are interested only in feathering their own nests at the expense um, of the local community. They are not paramilitaries, they are parasites. They feed off the backs of local communities and they destroy local communities. And so it is important um, that we do have a criminal justice response. We can only do that with the full cooperation of the community. And so I guess the, the question is to test the justice system, to bring forward that information to the PSNI and to others. If you feel afraid, use Crime Stoppers to do so anonymously, but allow us to work together with the PSNI to ensure that these people can be brought to justice. I would be quite happy um, for more of these people um, to be brought to justice and be brought to justice very quickly in order that the rest of our community can move on and live in peace. Ms Linda Dillon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Almost forgot it in English. Apologies. Um, obviously, I, I watched the Spotlight program also, and would like to also reiterate the remarks that have already been said in terms of offering condolences to the family. And, and it, it was very difficult to watch. And as somebody who also was in receipt of a threat for speaking up for others who have been threatened by this organisation that we are talking about. Um, I would like to say that we can't have enough in terms of legislation and policing around the issue. But can the Minister give us a legislative timetable for the additional legislation in relation to tackling organised crime that was consulted on late in 2020? 
Well, there are a number of threads um, to the member's question. I'm happy to provide her with a detailed um, response in terms of the work that the department itself is doing, but I can give an updated response with respect to the work that was commenced last year um, with the su full support of the Justice Committee with respect to the Criminal Finances Act and commencement um, of the remaining parts of that in Northern Ireland. We had hoped that that would be brought forward at Westminster um, in, in the first quarter of this year. Um, due to uh, pressures on the legislative programme there, it will now be brought forward um, by June at the latest. However, the four um, pieces of subordinate legislation that were required have now been drafted and have gone through. There are four more pieces that are to be done in collaboration with Westminster for that to complete its course. And at that point, we will have access to all of the parts of the Criminal Finances um, Act, uh, which will include unexplained wealth orders. Um, it will include um, forfeiture of accounts and a whole series of other penalties. I firmly believe that these individuals, whilst they use a cloak of political cover in order to undertake their acts, are motivated purely and simply by greed. If there was no money in this, they would not be in it either. And so the sooner we can remove the assets that they accrue as a result of their criminal activity, the sooner we will put a stop to what is going on in those communities. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Um, Minister, in your previous answer, you mentioned political cover being given to these organisations. Um, we can't ignore the fact that this is happening in the context of increased tension around um, post-Brexit trade arrangements. Do you agree with me that it is a real risk that these, organ these criminal organisations will use tension to give cover to their vile acts? And would you agree with me that it's incumbent on all of us to ensure that, in our words, we do not enable and give uh, cover to those organisations um, to do that. Thank you. Well, I would say to the member, so it is and so it has always been, that people will exploit every tension in our community in order to give themselves some form of political legitimacy for the work that they do in intimidating, bullying, threatening um, and indeed murdering people in their own community. Um, it is nothing new, but it is every bit as horrendous now as it ever was during the Troubles. Um, from a perspective of leadership, I believe that all of us have a conversation to have with organisations who are still wedded to paramilitarism, but that is a simple conversation. It is to ask them when they are due to stop, because beyond that there is nothing more to be said. The time has come and gone for people to continue to talk about wanting to move forward, particularly on one hand when they say one month that they want to move forward and the next month they are sabre-rattling about the potential for further violence. You cannot ride two horses. Choose. Either you want to move away from violence, in which case get on with it, show us your bona fides and do it, and you will get nothing but support um, from those of us in this Assembly Chamber, or you want to continue to use the threat of violence and violence itself to coerce your community, in which case you will meet nothing from this Assembly Chamber but a police response. Before I call uh, Mr Roy Beggs, I remind members that question 13 has been withdrawn. Although the minister would have been setting a record if she had got to question 13, and topical question 7 has also been withdrawn. I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Number three. It is challenging to provide an accurate assessment of the level of illegal money lending, due in part to the fact that it is underreported to authorities. However, the indications are that it is widespread within communities. We know that unregulated lenders or loan sharks prey on vulnerable people taking advantage of a lack of regulated loan availability for people who are in crisis because of their personal situation or because they need money quickly in an emergency. Evidence suggests that victims often work in low-income jobs or are in receipt of benefits. They may have mental health issues or addictions. They may be single parents or carers. And crucially, rightly or wrongly, they often believe that they have no other option. What is most apparent is that this is about vulnerability. And the more vulnerable a person is, the better it is for the illegal lenders. Often people focus on meeting the immediate need without thinking of the long-term consequences. This is a societal issue that links, in my opinion, to deprivation, to housing, social care, education, addiction and general crime. Illegal lending makes vulnerable citizens even more vulnerable and creates real fear in communities. All of this speaks to why this is an underreported issue and why people stay silent about it. Victims often fear for their safety and that of their family, and they may feel shame, making them even more reluctant to speak out. This is why the organisations seeing this issue most regularly are charities working with the most vulnerable. We also know that there is a link with drug supply and the collection of so-called drug debts by paramilitaries and organised crime gangs. 
Members will be aware that my department coordinates the Tackling Paramilitary Activity Criminal and Organised Crime Programme. Raising awareness of the harm caused by illegal lenders and ensuring that victims are supported are priorities for that programme. For example, a new public awareness campaign on this issue is under development, particularly in relation to how paramilitary gangs use illegal money lending to coerce and control vulnerable people. But this is an issue which crosses departmental boundaries, and I want to be clear that my department is committed to working collaboratively to stop those who carry out this crime and to help those who fall victim to it. Mr. Beggs. I, I agree with the Minister that loan sharks are, are frequently linked to organised crime groups and indeed uh, <coughs> continue to lend money and get it back by the coercive nature of, of who they are uh, and inflict great fear on individuals and those involved uh, in desperation to, to receive some funding. But my question to the Minister is Is Northern Ireland the only place, the only part of the UK without a dedicated uh, uh, group, uh, a team targeted towards uh, illegal money lenders, uh, and has she any plans to actually uh, ensure that there is such a dedicated policy and resource to tackle this issue, which is uh, particularly affecting vulnerable people in the community? Well, again, I thank the member for his question. <clears throat> I think part of the problem is, as I've said, that it is an underreported crime, and it's why education around this topic is incredibly difficult, but also incredibly important. The FCA regulations are detailed and complex and do require a degree of specialist knowledge in order to be able to deliver the kind of appropriate sanctions to which the member refers. Successful prosecutions and interventions by the police um, need to a follow-up in terms of a support package for the safety of the victim and for the wider community. In terms of the work that the Department is doing to address this issue and the harm caused, obviously there is no one type of victim of illegal money lending. The lenders know who to target. They also understand their finances, whether that be the day they get their benefits or the day they get paid, or if they get any kind of windfall and they target them accordingly. There is a huge amount of work going on in this space, as I have already alluded. Um, there are strong links between tackling organised crime and paramilitarism and tackling organised money lending, because the majority of money lending in our communities is unfortunately in the hands of paramilitaries, and tackling organised crime is one way of trying to tackle that. Ms. Orlea Flynn. Um, I thank the Minister for her response. And a lot of it has been covered, and I understand that you have explained, she has explained that a large amount of work is being done and that it may be cross-departmental. But given the impact that the issue of illegal and legal um, loan sharks have on our society and our communities, preying on the most vulnerable, does she agree that you know, what the systems that we have in place at present, that much more comprehensive measures are actually still requ required um, on top of what we have at the moment? Thank you. I think it's hugely important that we always look for opportunities to improve the systems that we have available to us. I think we need to work with the community. My own department will be rolling out an education programme um, as part of the Ending the Harm and Public Awareness campaign, uh, which again is about trying to explain the difficulties and the harm that is actually caused by money lending. Very often people um, in communities imagine that these people are out there to help them. They are not. They want to create a sense of perpetual indebtedness so that they can then manipulate and coerce people in the community to do things in order to clear their debts, which are never cleared. And that is, the, that is the shame of all of this, that it creates a constant desire on the person to clear their debt and an inability to do so. It is completely exploitative. It is completely wrong. And what we need to do is raise awareness of it, but we also need to raise the standards in terms of people's incomes. Because unless we tackle deprivation in our communities, unless we tackle people's ability not just to manage their finances but to have sufficient funds to live on, people will continue to find themselves in desperation, particularly in crisis situations, and they will turn to the easiest source of income. And for many people who have previously suffered difficult financial circumstances, there are no viable options for them at that point in time. And that's why it's so important that we look to say, how do we make sure that those in our community who are most vulnerable are not just protected when they report these issues, but are protected from the vulnerability that causes the problem in the first place. Ms. Sinead Bradley. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I, the Minister quite rightly spoke about just the, the nuances behind this, and people genuinely believe that the person perhaps lending the money to them is in some way their friend or giving favour, which, which we know not to be true. And it is, on reflection, difficult to see 
um, who would be reporting these crimes if that is the belief of the recipient. So I would ask the Minister, therefore, given that set of circumstances that we know they face, would she um, have any intention to target some investigatory work into areas where it is known and the, the phrase the dogs in the street know it's happening? Um, would she put some type of investigatory work into those postcode areas where this is most prevalent? Well, with respect to criminal investigation, obviously that would be a matter for the PSNI, but there is work ongoing, for example, from the Consumer Council to try to determine exactly the scope and scale um, of, of money lending. And whilst the member is, of course, right, <clears throat> people will all often approach someone when they are at a low point. They sidle alongside them as though they are a friend and they offer them money that looks like it comes with no strings attached. But I can assure you that it doesn't take long for people to realise that these people are not their friends. The first mispayment, the first difficulty that they have, um, they find out that they are not friends. Indeed, they are quite the opposite. Um, and I think that at that point there is an opportunity for people to come forward, but they are often afraid because they are ashamed, first of all, that they have got themselves into financial difficulties. They are often afraid to come forward because often they have been coerced into committing crimes as a result of their debt and they are afraid to speak out about that for fear of what might happen to them. And so we need to give people confidence to believe that if they come forward, their stories will be believed, they will be supported, but also that those who are responsible um, for the money lending in the first place will be held to account. And that is hugely important. I mean, we know the stories of people who get into debt and then their children are asked to run drugs in order to pay the debt off. I mean, what an obscene thing to do, to manipulate a desperate parent in order to use their child to earn money for a paramilitary organisation or an organised crime gang. It is obscene, it is wrong, it needs to stop, but we need the community to work with us and give us that information so that we can target it properly with the resources we have. Members, we're 25 minutes in, and I'm mindful of the fact that we're still on question three. I know that a lot of members were indicating they wanted to raise uh, some questions with the Minister on this, but I'm sure if you communicate to her, she'd be happy to write to you. Uh, I call Ms Emma Sheeran. Prison officers provide a vital public service, and I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to them for their commitment and their professionalism. Day and daily, they work with some of the most challenging members of our society, and I have witnessed it firsthand, as have many other members across this House, how they do so competently and with compassion. In terms of the composition of the organisation, approximately one third of the workforce is female. 69% of staff identify as coming from a Protestant background, 13% from a Catholic background and 18% non-determined. Around a third of the workforce is in each of these following age brackets. From 16 to 34, 33.4%, 35 to 49, 33.4% and 50 or over, 33.2%. It is important that all public sector organisations, including prison service, should be reflective of the communities they serve. While it is encouraging to see significant increases in the number of women in prison service and the majority of those successful in the most recent unit manager and senior officer competitions were female, there is further work to do to increase female representation. It is a matter of regret that we have not been able to increase representation from those who identify as coming from a Catholic background. While prison service will continue to reach out to all underrepresented groups, it is also important that every member of this House supports them in doing so. I have therefore asked the Director General to engage with all political parties in the Assembly to discuss how we might best reach all minority groups to increase representation and better reflect the community as we prepare to launch a further recruitment campaign in the autumn. Mr Speaker, it is incumbent on all of us to encourage those we represent to consider a career in the prison service. Ms. Sheeran. For your answer, Minister, as you've outlined yourself there, there's a massive underrepresentation of workers from a perceived uh, Catholic background in our prison services. And I know that inspection reports into several prisons, including at McGilligan and McGabry, have um, reported worse outcomes for Catholic prisoners, uh, presumably as a result of this. Can the Minister advise what steps are being taken to address these issues? The 2018 Criminal Justice Inspectorate McGabry Inspection Report recommendation to investigate outcomes experienced by Catholic prisoners. Um, in, result, in response to that, the Director General commissioned a research report from Queen's University Belfast. The report found no significant difference between Catholics and Protestants when all factors, in, including individual, societal, and prison related variables, are considered in relation to adjudication charges, guilty adjudications, preps, regime level, and spar involvement. 
NIPS establishments have an Equality and Diversity Committee chaired by the Deputy Governor. The committee consider a range of longitudinal data reports on all aspects of the prison regime. Whilst NIPS strives to provide the quality of opportunity, it is reliant on prisoners volunteering for certain posts and certain activities. Access to some posts may be restricted by disciplinary issues. However, it is important to us that all prisoners entering the system, regardless of the starting point, um, come out of the system rehabilitated and able to re-engage re successfully in society. Mr. Paul Given. Um, they need to encourage all people to apply to the prison services well made, irrespective of their community background, and that's something that should be encouraged by all of us. However, it is worth putting on the record, Minister, that for decades prison officers were targeted by terrorist organisations from across our community, not least by those within the provisional IRA. And will she reject the slur by Ms Sheeran that just because a prisoner is Catholic that somehow they have been targeted as a, as a basis of the religion, which he clearly inferred and should retract? Well, I'm not going to take that line of approach, though I accept entirely what the member says in good faith. But I think what Ms Sheeran was highlighting was a report that actually showed that there was an issue in terms of the outcomes for prisoners of um, a, a Catholic background in the report. However, thankfully, when that was looked into in detail, it was not as a result of discrimination being operated within the prison. And I think that that's an important point. I think it is too often that people um, attribute causality where there is simply um, some coalescence around other factors and we need to be incredibly cautious about this. I entirely agree uh, with what the member says with respect to the level of threat. I mean, let's be clear, this is not a historic artefact. Prison officers today are facing threats in the community. Prison officers today are intimidated. Their families are intimidated. It is not an easy job to do, any more than it is an easy job um, to be a member of the police service, but it is a crucial job. It is a vitally important job, which gives really important service to everyone in our community. Because remember, many of those who are in our prison system are there because we are trying to protect the entire community, not just one part of it or another, but the entire community from people who would otherwise be a danger to society. Prison officers put themselves in a situation where they have to work with those people, where they bring those people forward, but also where they try to develop those people so that when they finally release from prison, they are able to contribute to society in a constructive way. I think they deserve a huge amount of support and credit for that. And I want to see prison, prison officers from every possible background in our prison service continuing that good work. Thank you. That concludes um, this section of questions. Um, we now move on to topical questions to the Minister, and I call Ms Liz Kimmins. Good for you, Les Cancola, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, can you outline what measures are in place to ensure that women, who are not, are, are, that women are not intimidated or deterred from accessing vital health services due to street prote protests taking place outside the John Mitchell Place Clinic in Newry? Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I realise that abortion is an emotive subject and one on which people have very strong views. However, whilst everyone has the right to express their views, women have the right to access medical treatment without fear, without intimidation and without interference. These protests mean that women at a very vulnerable time in their lives have to endure further trauma and distress. Where protests are directed at trust premises, they also impact those attending the facility for many other reasons, including children, young people, the elderly and the health trust staff themselves. No one in our society should be deterred from accessing health care or being subjected to protests and images that they find distressing or offensive. This is an issue which I will continue to monitor and keep under consideration because I do believe that whilst the right to protest is an important one, the right to do so respectfully and the responsibility to do so respectfully is also of extreme importance. Ms Kimmins. Minister, for her answer. Minister, can you commit then to implementing safe zones around healthcare um, facilities which provide compassionate care like this to ensure that women don't have to suffer further intimidation, harassment or abuse while accessing these services? Well, the member will be aware that as a member of this assembly, it is something that I do support and I would like to see brought forward. I believe people have a right to protest. I think that asking them to protest at a distance where they're not able to intimidate or cause fear in those approaching um, a particular place is a reasonable request. However, um, for us to bring that forward as a piece of legislation, <coughs> pardon me, would require 
um, executive agreement. There have been previous debates on this matter in other places, in Belfast City Council, for example, where there was almost unanimous support um, for the fact that um, harassment of people seeking services should not be acceptable to anyone. And that came from right across the spectrum politically, um, from those who consider themselves pro-life to those who consider themselves pro-choice. I think we need to open that conversation in order that we can take this forward, because I believe, irrespective of the passion with which one holds one's opinions on termination of pregnancy. Having dignity and respect towards the, 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 the woman, the pregnant person in these situations is incredibly important. And I think that everyone ought to be able to agree that any form of harassment, intimidation or distress being caused to women approaching a medical facility is unacceptable. Mr. Cathal Boylan. Good pre-blast, Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Will the Minister commit to introducing the Violence Against Women and Girls strategy? The Member may well be aware, um, through discussions that we have had um, over the weekend, um, that I have submitted a paper to the Executive. That paper was discussed um, at Executive today and will be discussed further, <coughs> pardon me, hopefully for a decision um, on Thursday. I am absolutely committed. Um, to ensuring that violence against women and girls is tackled, both direct violence and indirect violence. I think it is hugely important. However, I make the point that I have made many times. By the time people contact the justice system, they are already victims. I believe that the emphasis must move upstream. How do we protect women and girls from violence? How do we change the societal attitudes which make it acceptable for people to be screamed at in the street, wolf whistled, heckled, abused on their way to work? How do we deal with the attitudes that give people that sense of entitlement? So I think we need to move this beyond simply a justice response, albeit that I believe a justice response is hugely important. What I have recommended is a cross-departmental strategy that will encompass education, health and indeed all of the other departments. And I believe rightfully that the place where that should be led from is the Executive Office because it has ultimately the coordinating responsibility in the Executive. But that is not to step back from the issue because I am absolutely committed that we should have such an issue. When it comes to criminal justice, the law must be blind to issues of gender. Any victim of domestic and sexual abuse must be able to seek recourse at the law, must be protected in law, and also must have access to the support services that they need. When it comes to dealing with the attitudes, I believe it should be gendered, because we know that more women are affected than men by these crimes. Mr Boylan. And I do agree and appreciate the Minister's answer. But would the Minister agree that gender-based violence leads to gender-specific issues, which requires gender-specific gender interventions, and a violence against women and girls strategy would actually complement existing strategies on the Domestic Abuse, Abuse Act? I do agree, um, but as I have said already, I think that we need to move upstream. Uh, the Department of Justice, I think, has shown, and I have had a particular priority attached to this since taking on the Ministry. We have had the Domestic Abuse um, and Civil Proceedings Act, which was passed very swiftly by the Committee. Uh, we have now moved on to look at the Stalking um, Bill, which is before the Committee. We are looking at speeding up justice, which is one of the recommendations of Sir John Gillan's review, um, when it comes um, to um, ensuring that those who are subject to some of the, mo the, the most um, sensitive of crimes in terms of serious sexual offences can get justice and get justice quickly. We are also taking forward in the miscellaneous provisions bill, which will hopefully be in front of the Assembly by May, um, many of the other recommendations in respect of the Gillen Review and also some of those areas which disproportionately affect women and girls, for example, um, dealing with things like upskirting and downblousing and other intrusive practices. So we're doing a lot in the legislative sphere, but we're also doing a lot in terms of policy and practice, the creation of remote evidence centres, um, additional support for vulnerable victims and witnesses to ensure they give their best evidence, um, and also the strategy, and the member mentioned about how we respond, also the strategy we have for dealing with women in custody, which is which like for consultation, in terms of targeted responses to, to offending from women and girls, which often has a very different driver to their male counterparts and needs to be dealt with differently in terms of rehabilitation. Further to that, I think it's also important, however, that we don't only have a criminal justice response to these issues. So I think that that's the point that I'm making, that we need a much wider response that is about society saying it is unacceptable for women and girls to be treated in this way. If we value the women in our society, 
then we need to treat them with dignity and respect. And if we value the young men in our society, then we need to raise them with stronger values so that they don't think it's acceptable to be disrespectful to women. Mr. Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, this last few days, much focus has been on the New Decade New Approach document and some aspects of that, and some members are particularly focused on their own pet projects in that. However, Minister, for me, on this side of the, the benches, there has been much focus on not achieving the 7,500 numbers, uh, sorry, police officers in the NDNA, and indeed in a previous agreement, actually back as far as 1998, where we were promised 2,500 uh, reserve officers. What is your department doing in relation to that and other aspects of the NDNA that comes under your portfolio? Um, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, with respect to NDNA, we have already um, started the work to fulfil our commitments. For example, um, the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act was part of the NDNA commitments. With respect to the specific issue around policing numbers, there is a real challenge um, at this stage in terms of the budget. A flat cash budget will not allow um, for a huge amount of wiggle room for the PSNI. Indeed, my fear is um, that we could end up having spoken with the Chief Constable with a reduction in numbers rather than additional numbers. I have bid for the additional funding that was committed to in the NDNA um, report. I have asked for that funding to be made available. How the Chief Constable would spend that money is obviously a matter for him, and I would not be directing him in terms of what he would, how he would spend it. But we do know that there is a, an amount of around £40 million that would be required per annum to be, to be contained within the budget in order to allow the Chief Constable to recruit the number of additional officers that he would require. It would also take time, so it would not be an immediate panacea in terms of police numbers, but I do believe that there should be a commitment um, to fund what we agreed in the NDNA. However, I also recognise, as anyone who reads the NDNA document will, that the ambition of the list, of the wish list attached, far exceeded the commitment of finance. And I think it's a, a point of constant disappointment to me um, that many of, the, um, many of the things that were included within the NDNA um, document and which were promised in the NDNA document were never actually properly assessed in terms of value for money or indeed whether or not they would be deliverable. Um, but I will continue to bid for that funding for the PSNI because I believe they do need additional officers and I do they believe they do need additional support. Mr. Clark, can I thank the Minister for her answer and indeed some of the work she's done in relation to bringing forward some of the, the projects she's referred to? Of course, um, once you have made the bid, I suppose, and, and you've said that you cannot direct the Chief Constable, I suppose it brings us into question actually what's the purpose of having a target in it, given that we can't hold the Chief Constable to account in relation to 7,500. But also, could you address in, the, in my question in relation to the old commitments for the 2,500 reserve officers, who actually take up some of the slack for some of our officers who are on full time duties? And indeed, actually, I've listened to the tenor of the questions today. Much of those are actually going to fall back eventually on the police and additional burden and workload for those. So I welcome the, the work that the Minister has done, but if she can answer specifically in terms of 2,500. Well, with, uh, with respect to the PSNI budget, as you know, um, it is not my job to oversee the PSNI budget. That is a matter um, for the Policing Board. And with Mervyn's story sitting just down the chamber, I would know better than to try and trample into that territory. Um, I, would, I would be very quickly shooed away, so I will, I will stay away from that. It is a matter for the, the, the Chief Constable to decide how best to deploy resources, and that is as it should be. Um, and if he decides that the money um, should be spent on other things because he feels that's a better way to deal with things, that's a matter for the Chief Constable. However, the fundamental point from my perspective is that we made a commitment to fund the Chief Constable so he could have an increase. Um, in numbers. It was never agreed that it would happen by a certain date or a certain time, but I think if we're moving in the, the reverse direction, that doesn't set a good example. Um, we are working with the Chief Constable through Outline Business Case and all of those other processes, so we continue to do that. But realistically, unless we get additional funding, um, the Chief Constable will not have any scope um, to be able to expand numbers at, at any level. Um, in, this, in this next year. And that, to me, is a matter of regret because I believe, as the member has rightly said, we ask a lot of the police. Um, we ask them to intervene, particularly at the moment, in situations which are not strictly criminal justice issues but which are health issues. We ask them to intervene on a whole range of complex issues. And yet, um, I think we haven't, at this stage, prioritised, prioritised sufficiently um, the funding. 
And to put it in context, it's not simply a matter that we could just jiggle things around in the department's budget to make this work. The PSNI already takes up 70% of the budget of the Department of Justice, and we have other statutory duties that we simply can't evade that need to be met from that budget. Ms Paula Bradley. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, we know over this past year, um, due to COVID restrictions, that some of the court dates um, have, have slipped past. And in relation to specifically to do with family court proceedings, can I ask you um, where we are in relation to the timeline on that line? Are we nearly back to those near normal um, uh, timelines for, for the many people that require our family court? With respect to court recovery, um, I'm bringing forward a cross-departmental uh, or a cross-justice, um, sorry, cross-justice um, agency bid um, for recovery funds in order to let us, first of all, recover um, particularly the criminal justice system, but also um, in terms of being able to bring forward a number of other issues. Um, in terms of the of the civil and family justice side. Work has continued throughout the pandemic in terms of family justice, though it may have proceeded more slowly than would be normally the case. Um, but we are now back at a situation where the family courts are operating throughout this. They have been operating in new uh, ways in terms of using um, digital justice and trying to find alternative ways of moving forward. Not all of the levers, of course, in the family and civil justice arena are in my control. But as I set out this morning in my statement um, to the Assembly, I do want to see progress in this issue over the next year. We are very focused on recovery. It is an important issue and one that we have to take forward. Thank you, Minister. I am afraid that concludes uh, question time to the Minister for Justice. If members would take their ease for a few moments uh, while there is a change at the top table, we will then move on to questions to the Assembly Commission. And if you are leaving the Chamber, uh, please do not forget to wipe down the surface where you were. Thank you.